that Hazan, the choirs that you've put together have been wonderful, and I really appreciate all the different uh, all the different people that have participated in this way. And it is wonderful to see all of you here, because to be honest, I haven't seen some of you since last year. <laughs> And it is wonderful to be back, truly. Um, let's not do it only next year at this time, um, that we're here every week. Uh, and uh, we're here on Saturdays and on Tuesdays and on Thursdays and really every day that there is something here at Shul um, uh, for, for you. And so welcome. But my sermon this year is not clever or complicated. My message is not hidden, it is not esoteric, it doesn't come from the depths of mysticism or academia's ivory towers. Today is a hard topic that may touch on the colloquial third rail, but it's important for us to discuss. I know you will not agree with every word that I am going to say, but I ask that you not close yourself off to my message or my intent. My message is this, our political culture is broken and we must fix it. I will not turn the BEMA into an MSNBC or Fox TV studio. We have enough professional commentators in the congregation already. <laughs> and this is not about President Trump specifically or exclusively. It is about who we are. It is about who we want to be. And I am here to speak about Judaism and our vision for rebuilding this great country. For millions of Jews who immigrated to America, this has been a land of freedom, of opportunity, of security. In the 1880s, one Jewish poet wrote that America allowed Jews the freedom to love the law that Moses brought, to sing the songs of David and to think the thoughts Gabriel to Spinoza taught, freedom to dig the common earth, to drink the universal air. For this they sought refuge over wave and continent, to link Egypt with Texas, the poet wrote, in their mystic chain, and truth's perpetual lamp forbid to wane. The poem, In Exile, was written by Emma Lazarus. For Jews, America has fulfilled so many dreams. But now our political culture is broken and we must fix it. Because we have benefited from the Golden Medina, we must do our part to find a way out of this mess. We blame Republicans or Democrats. We blame the far ends of the political spectrum. And too easily we say they broke it and we are victims of their extreme amoral actions. Thus, if it is their fault, they must change, not us. But often blame is a tool to discharge our own responsibilities, to roll up our sleeves and make difficult choices. So to be clear, there is no moral equivalence between those spewing hate directly and through dog whistle and others having legitimate policy debates. America's brokenness is seen in the blatant disregard for truth common decency and disagreement, continual abdication of small d democratic values of branches of government, checking the powers of, of other branches, with all due respect. <laughs> As I was reviewing this talk, Speaker Pelosi announced that an impeachment inquiry would begin for President Trump because I wrote this over a week ago and the news has shifted so dramatically. But while the political and legal process will move at their own pace and direction, our brokenness did not begin with President Trump and it will not disappear at the terminus of his presidency. We must look at the political culture beyond this specific administration, regardless if the next is red or blue or purple. Maybe Hobbes and Locke were right about our true nature. Our political culture has laid bare our worst instincts to divide each other, belittle perceived enemies, exercise unrestrained power, and govern for the few rather than the many. 
President Trump has normalized these characteristics in our politics. Their frequency has dulled our rage. Thomas Paine knew the longer that we accepted political wrongdoings, we eventually would accept them as palpable and even unremarkable. In 1776, he wrote in the introduction to Common Sense, a long habit of not thinking a thing wrong gives it a superficial appearance of being right and raises at first a formidable outcry in defense of custom, but the tumult soon subsides. Time, he writes, makes more converts than reason. Repeating wrongdoings over and over again desensitizes us. Eventually, a wrong almost feels right. Time makes more converts than reason. Our political culture feeds our base selves, and elections are mirrors into who we are. In Julian Zelizer's article in The Atlantic titled, America's Mirror on the Wall, he lays out that President Trump's election was the convergence of deep political feelings. He writes, it is tempting to think of the worst elements of President Trump's tenure as a deviation from American history. The nativism, the racism, the anti-Semitism, the sexism, the insular xenophobic nationalism that have circled around this president and have sometimes flared from within him have been too unsettling to be smoothly incorporated into the American understanding of, of our nation's fundamental values. Americans must be better than that, or so many say. Zelizer continues, but to understand, but that understanding of America lets the country off the hook too easily. Viewing the aggressive and socially divisive elements of President Trump's conservatism, populism, as a deviation from the enlightened path of the nation romanticizes the American political tradition as being purely and exclusively about cherished values such as liberty and freedom and equality, opportunity, representation, free markets, and justice. This view of America whitewashes away huge swaths of U.S. history in order to perpetuate the myth that at its essence, America is a shining city on a hill. America is many things. We are a great nation but not because we never make mistakes. We are a great nation because of our ability to overcome our errors and shortcomings. We are a great, we are a great nation because we are able to learn and refocus and move forward together. And we will need to rely on that greatness if we are going to extricate ourselves from this quagmire. Two years ago, I shared my concern that the threads which hold us together as a country were fraying. During those high holidays, I said, we are living in a time in America where the divisions amongst us are pronounced, painful, and growing. Then I said, America's founding fathers knew 250 years ago there were dangers of deep splits within the country. While they focused on the rifts between loyalists and patriots and other issues, America's founders knew what bound us together was more than only an aversion to the raw authority of the British crown. I said they understood the ties which formed America were both profound and fragile. For them, it was inevitable, it was not inevitable that America would succeed. There was significant doubt if we could accept being bound together and accountable to each other rather than a far off ruler. I said that the sacred knot of America was becoming unbound. Friends, this is happening. The strains that divide us are breaking our system. We must do better and we must be better. Within Bethel, I hear the anxiousness, disgust, embarrassment, and indignation about the president's character and many of his policies. There are countless moderate Republicans as well who feel trapped by a party which has mutated into something they do not recognize. It has become something they are not proud of. Within Bethel, I have also heard people express feelings of polarization which have surprised me. 
I have tried to keep my ears open to everyone within the congregation, even as I have my own clear opinions. The voices which haunt me are those statements such as these, and I'm paraphrasing actual conversations. How can you talk about constructive dialogue when they're out to get me? I am a lesbian Jewish mother. I am the daughter of an immigrant father. They hate me. I can't talk to them while they're actively working to curtail my rights and calculating new ways to delegitimize me as a person, one person said. Another individual within Bethel, and he describes himself as a lone voice within the shul's political shades of blueness, described to me, the president is a flawed person, but he is shaking up a system that has become crippled by its own overreach and meddling, he said. While not elegant, the president is changing the system, and that takes breaking some China along the way. It's about time we recalibrate the country. The president is correcting past wrongs that other administrations forced on us. Well, discussing what the phrase recalibrate the country means or might be code for is something important, but for a different sermon. These conversations within our own Bethel walls have been raw, and passionate and sincere. And neither has space for the other. In the wake of our national politics, we are divided and unable to see beyond party affiliation. The intense anger and bitterness is palpable across the political spectrum, but also across our neighborhoods and grocery stores and lunch conversations and places we gather. We are living in a charged political climate which is on edge and this is the political environment that we've created for our children. But as the adage says, the first step in getting yourself out of a hole is to stop digging. So let's stop digging. Let's stop blaming and decide we are going to move forward together. We are going to push against the politics of division. As my old math teacher used to say, you get a lot more out of multiplying than dividing. So for starts, we already know our hopes for our country. You may not realize it, but as Jewish Americans, we have already put it to prayer. I ask you to pick up your moxor again and turn to page 117. Page 117 in the moxor. The prayer for country has been part of the prayer book for centuries. Dr. Jonathan Sarna, the great historian of American Jewish life, teaches us throughout their long history in the diaspora, Jews have, respite, have recited special prayers for the welfare of the government. The biblical prophet Jeremiah, writing from Jerusalem to the Jewish community exiled in Babylonia, explained one rationale behind this practice. Seek the welfare of the city to which I, God, have exiled you, and pray to the Lord on its behalf for in its prosperity you shall prosper. Sarna continues, the Jewish political philosophy as articulated later in Perkei Avot and then throughout rabbinic literature assumes that a government, even an oppressive government, is superior to anarchy. We hear this prayer every Shabbat, but we tend to not pay attention to it. It is a nice honor to give to a relative of a bar mitzvah, but listen to the hope and the values expressed in these words. Our God and God of our country, with mercy accept our prayer on behalf of our country and its government. Pour out your blessing upon the land, upon its leaders, its judges, officers, and officials who devote in good faith to the needs of the public. Instruct them with the law of your Torah and help them understand your rules of justice so that peace and security, happiness and freedom will never depart from our land. We pray, Adonai, God whose spirit is in all creatures, awaken that spirit within all the inhabitants of the land, uproot from their hearts hatred and malice, jealousy and strife. Plant among those of different nationalities and faiths who dwell in our nation, love and companionship, peace and friendship. May it therefore be your will that our land be a blessing to all who dwell on earth and cause them to dwell in friendship and freedom. Speedily fulfill the vision of your prophet. Nation shall not lift sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. For all of them, 
from the least of them to the greatest, shall know me. And let us say, Amen. It feels like we are a long way from those ideals. How we pray, what we pray, the political climate in which we pray have always mattered, and today is no different. But prayer is not enough. We need action. So how do we move forward? I want to introduce you to some amazing people who are working hard within the Bethel community to transform the political climate. These are not far off people. These are our neighbors. If they can roll up their sleeves, we can too. They are looking beyond the immediate headlines and tweets and to strengthen our political climate. There are many more people within our midst doing important work in this vein, but here are two. As the prayer for the country tells us, awaken the spirit within all the inhabitants of our land. So let me tell you about Julia Zebrak. Julie and her family have been Bethel members since 2005. Their girls went through the preschool and religious school. Her oldest daughter just went off to college, and the younger one is in high school. Julie started a grassroots organization called Yes Moms Can, focused on getting women engaged in politics. Julie describes her work as helping to demystify ways to get involved. She describes some of the work as simply asking a question differently. Can you volunteer for a campaign? The knee-jerk reaction, she says, is always no. But can you host a casual wine and cheese evening at your house for people to make calls? Julie says that the second question usually gets a yes because it's more specific and it's easy to open your home. In her experience, more and more people are saying yes. If you don't want to knock on doors, you can drive other volunteers or drop off water or brownies. The issues are diverse. Voter access, 2020 census, gun safety, reproductive rights, countless local issues, the candidates of your choice. Julie used to work at the Department of Justice, but has found a new passion. She told me, if people sit silently in their homes, change does not happen. People need to physically show up because it makes a difference. Further, she told me activism is not just about ourselves, but teaching and modeling for our kids what being politically engaged and responsible looks like. Talking with Julie is inspiring. She emphasizes that the ability to have a voice begins with saying yes. It starts by deciding to act, to influence, to do our part to change the political climate. And she told me we must use our voices, be substantive, and be thoughtful. Uproot from our hearts hatred and malice, jealousy and strife. Rob Fersh and his family have been Bethel members since 1983. His four kids went through the preschool, and now his grandson attends BEPS as well. That they are a founding family of Bethel's Family Camp, which is an annual weekend retreat over Memorial Day. It's been going on for over 20 years. Rob founded Convergence in 2009. Convergence's mission is to convene individuals and organizations with divergent views to build trust, identify solutions, and form alliances for action on critical national issues. They are doing important work in bringing together leaders to see beyond their issues and positions. Rob works with labor and corporate leaders, school boards and unions, congressional and state leaders, to find new options to address health care and hunger and other issues. Rob told me, it is a tragedy that, that, we don't, that we don't use our collective intelligence to solve shared problems. He described that larger forces have divided us. We need to create a call not for demonizing each other, but solving the serious issues of our country. The only litmus test, he says, is if you are willing to listen to others who have opposing but reasoned opinions. Rob described that in his experience, he's too often seen good people caught in a difficult system. Rob and Convergence are bringing people together to find common interests and seen beyond their opening positions. And finally, 
plant among those of different nationalities and faiths who dwell in our nation love and companionship, peace and friendship. Better Angels is an incredible organization focused on reducing political polarization by bringing liberals and conservatives together to understand each other beyond stereotypes, forming red-blue community alliances, teaching practical skills for communicating across political differences, and making a strong public argument for depolarization. In December 2016, 10 Trump supporters and 11 Clinton supporters gathered in South Lebanon, Ohio, in what became the first Better Angels Red-Blue Workshop. Their goal was to see if they could respectfully disagree and find any common ground. To me, too, too many people believe their political adversaries are not simply misguided, but they are bad people whose ways of thinking are both dangerous and incomprehensible. The result of this Better Angels workshop was remarkable. They were surprised they actually liked each other. They wanted to know more about each other. They wanted to keep on meeting. And I want to bring Better Angels here. I want Bethel to host a series of workshops that will be open to the greater community to see beyond the divisive rhetoric. I want us to roll up our sleeves with our neighbors at the churches and the mosques to create the political culture in which we want to live. I need your help and participation to create a discourse which builds community and strengthens bonds between neighbors rather than exploiting wedges between friends. And please email me if you want to work together to bring better angels to Bethel and create new ways for us to come together. I will close by sharing a story of President Abraham Lincoln's response to his pastor's well-crafted sermon. An aide asked Mr. Lincoln his appraisal of the sermon, and the president thoughtfully replied, the content was excellent. He delivered with, with eloquence, and he had put work into the message. So it was an excellent sermon. No, Lincoln answered, but you said that the content was excellent. Well, that's true, Lincoln said, but Reverend Gurley forgot the most important ingredient he forgot to ask us to do something great. Friends, we are stuck in a fractured political culture. We must make a way out, and we can only do this together. I'm asking us to do something great. Join me as we start Better Angels conversations in the community. Do something great by pushing against the voices which seek to divide us, to humiliate us and belittle us. Stand up for the moderate voices, red and blue, that have been muted by tweet storms and calculated indignities. Stand up for what we want our country to be. And I believe we as Jews must be an orlegoim, a light unto the nations, to show that we can blaze a path forward. This is a national crisis, but we must act locally, within our own spheres of influence. Do not let wedge voices convince us that we do not have common interests and motivations. We must push against the extreme voices and reclaim the uniting power of the middle. The current state of our politics is not acceptable. If we remain on this trajectory, we will tear the republic apart. We cannot remain scared and divided and demoralized. We cannot stay on the sidelines. We must reclaim the vision of Emma Lazarus to have the freedom to love the law that Moses brought. For this, they sought refuge over wave and continent and truth's perpetual lamp forbid to wane. We have put our aspirations to paper too. So again, let's turn to page 117 and I ask you to stand and let's read the prayer for country together and let's really mean it. <laughs> 